Good evening, good evening, good evening. Pastor Daniel Dagan here, Hope Apostolic United Pentecostal Church. I am doing my Friday 1 p.m. Prophecy Live session tonight, Thursday night. And I'm going to just share it and direct everybody to it. And um, I just want to mention, this is our new book on prophecy, The Unveiling. It's 310 pages. And um, you can order one from me by emailing us at pastordagan at gmail.com. Again, I am going to do my normal Friday 1 p.m. Prophecy Live session now, tonight. So, and I'll just share it because I'm, I'm on vacation this week and me and my wife was talking and we both felt like it would be good for me to continue these teachings. But I'm going to actually be out and about tomorrow doing some things with my family at 1 p.m. So I'm going to teach this lesson now. And um, we're going to have a good time. So let's pray and we'll have a good time. Lord Jesus, I thank you, mighty God, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love and your kindness. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, amen. I want to teach in this lesson now, Prophecy Live, dealing with end time subjects. And is it ever more relative than it is now? Is it ever more relative than it is now? Prophecies being fulfilled literally moment by moment. We've been teaching the last couple of Fridays at 1 p.m. on the 21 judgments, tribulation judgments of the book of Revelation. Excuse me. And we taught on previously the seven seal judgments, the seven trumpet judgments. And then we finished last week dealing with, yea, the sixth into the seventh vial judgments, which is the end of the end of the seven years of tribulation. And in that seventh vile judgment, if you have your Bible, go there with me to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. And, and we see the seventh vile or bold judgment. As the sixth judgment ends, the kings prepare to gather together from around the world to actually annihilate or finish the Jewish problem to kill the Jews working in concert with the wishes of the Antichrist. That's the end of the sixth vile judgment. You remember those three demonic spirits jump out the mouth of Satan, the mouth of the Antichrist, the mouth of the false prophet that go around the world, the influence of kings of the earth. You read that early in the chapter and and they gather the kings of the earth. There it is, Revelation 16, 16. They gathered them to a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, such as was not seen since were men upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. The great city, yea, Jerusalem, was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath or God's wrath. This is the end of Mother Babylon. We'll get deeper into this, but this is just a prelude to what's coming. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, and every stone about the weight of a talent, about 150 pounds, about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plagues of the hail. And the plague there was exceedingly great. That's the description of the seventh vile judgment. The last of the seven vile, most severe judgments. The last of the 21 total judgments of the seven years of tribulation. And the sixth vile judgment brings us up to Armageddon. And the seventh vile judgment, part of it, is Armageddon. That's what I want to talk about. The battle of Armageddon. You have all kinds of movies written about it, acted out. You see all kinds of books. You see many different articles. And every 
major event that happens in the world, people says this is Armageddon. It's like Armageddon. So it's it's a word even in non-Christian, non-religious circles. It's a word that people's heard, people's familiar with it. What is Armageddon? It is the human purpose of Armageddon as the Antichrist is reigning over the governments of the world is to gather the kings of the earth together, together under the leadership of the Antichrist against Israel. They're not coming together with the preconceived plan and idea that Jesus is going to come down on the white horse. No. Armageddon, what, what allows the kings of the earth to come together and to be in a place where Jesus can come back on the white horse to Armageddon, to absolutely destroy the Antichrist. What brings the kings together of the earth in allegiance to and in support of the Antichrist at the end of the closing days of the seven years of tribulation is the Antichrist plan and plot to destroy Israel, to destroy the Jews. You remember the seven years of tribulation begins, fulfill the Holy Ghost already. The seven years of tribulation begins with Daniel 9, 27, the Antichrist signing the covenant that allows the establishing and built up, building up of the tribulation temple, but more specifically, the resuming of the daily sacrifices and oblations in the courtyard and in the temple, the tribulation temple. And they're allowed to do that. Israel is allowed to do that for the first 42 months until the abomination desolation. The weeks to come will deal specifically with the lesson on the abomination desolation, things of that sort. But then the second half of the seven years of tribulation, after the abomination desolation, which is when the Antichrist comes into the temple, stops the sacrifices, sets himself up as God in the Jewish temple, tribulation temple in Jerusalem. Then that begins the great tribulation that's talked about in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. And then that brings on the great wrath of God, these final 42 months, yea, the seven vile judgments. And then ultimately the end of that is Armageddon, with the kings of the earth certainly, certainly, certainly influenced by demonic spirits. We've seen that already. They have gathered together in allegiance to the Antichrist vision to destroy Israel. That's what brings the kings of the earth, the armies of the earth to Armageddon and sets the stage for Jesus to come. The location of Armageddon. You read the word here, Armageddon in Revelation 16. You read the word Antichrist multiple times in John's writing, 1 John. The beast is what he's called in the book of Revelation. Another beast is what the false prophets called by name in the book of Revelation. And then also um, the one that would speak lies and perform miracles um, under inspiration of satanic power, the false prophet. Okay, now let's talk about the location of Armageddon where the Antichrist and the false prophet will gather with the kings of the earth to ultimately make an effort to destroy Israel. It won't happen, but that's their plan. Armageddon, when you really begin to unpack it, it is in the valley of Estralon, Estralon, the valley of Estralon, which is in the modern map of Israel. I've looked at it multiple times. In the modern map of Israel, it is in northern Israel, it is about 20 miles south, southeast of Haifa. Haifa is one of the major cities in Israel. It's very developed. They have on um, Western sports, basketball, things of that nature. They have on, um, uh, you know, basketball leagues and commercial shopping centers, things of that nature. Haifa. And Armageddon is about 50 miles north of Jerusalem. So it's about 20 miles southeast of Haifa, about 50 miles north of Jerusalem. That's Armageddon. This area was the scene of many Old Testament battles. This place, the valley, that would be Armageddon. And it's it's identified with different language in Scripture. We'll get deeper into this. But this valley is significant 
many Old Testament battles. You can look at Judges chapter 4, chapter 7 speaks of some of the battles that happened in ancient times at this same place. Napoleon, you remember Napoleon Bonaparte, Napoleon called this the greatest place to wage battle just because of the geographical layout and the elements of it. Perhaps that's what that's what the Antichrist has in mind. He doesn't know he's walking to his death. He's walking, he's marching to his death, to his ultimate end. The Mediterranean Sea is off the coast of Israel, of course. It's look at the map, it's a major body of water just to the to the um, far west of Israel. And Egypt is to the southwest, and Jordan is to the southeast. And as you see off um, to the southwest of Israel is Egypt. It's Egypt. And and then you, you begin to read a bit more there as we've studied last week in Revelation 16, the significance in verse 12 to 15 of the river Euphrates. You've seen this as well in one of the previous trumpet judgments. You remember if you was with me when we studied that. The rivers Euphrates um, as you begin to study, the river Euphrates is surrounded by Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. And the river Euphrates is mentioned in the breath that Armageddon is mentioned in Revelation 16. So that puts you in the region of the world, of course, Israel, but right there more specifically, just 50 miles north of Jerusalem, 20 miles or so south, southeast of Haifa, Right there in that region is where Armageddon is going to be at. So that's what Armageddon is in the mind of the Antichrist. The gathering of the kings, the, mil the military powers of the world at the end, at the ending days of the seven years of tribulation to deal with and annihilate Israel once and for all. It tells you where it's at and it tells you the time period of it, the ending days of the tribulation. Okay, we have read through the sixth bowl judgment. Now, let me just give some, some focal points as you move more into a description of Armageddon. Okay, this is the end of the seven years of tribulation, and this corresponds with Armageddon, but it doesn't just correspond with Armageddon. Might I say more specifically, it ties to the ending of an age or dispensation. After Armageddon, when you study the closing verses of Revelation 12, you, you begin to see, you got to dig a little bit close here. It gives some numbers associated with days, 1,200 plus, in the ending verses of the chapter 12 of the book of Daniel. But when you begin to dig into that with some of the things that said in Revelation about 1,260 days and 42 months and some of that, you begin to see that when the seven years of tribulation is over, there's going to be a 75-day interval, scripturally, between the end of the seven years of tribulation before the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ upon the earth. And that's, that's believed by most scholars. I agree. I think it's very logical. I can see it. It's believed to be a time in which God heals the earth because the earth over the seven years of tribulation is going to experience things that it's never experienced before. It's going to be a time of cleansing of the earth, if you will. And then the thousand-year millennial kingdom will begin. So at the end of the seven years of tribulation, it's not just because it's the end of the seven years of tribulation, that it's the end also of the times of the Gentiles. But it's the end of the age. It's the end of the age. Church age ends prior to the seven years of tribulation. Then you have the end of the time of the tribulation, but then you're at the beginning of the millennium, the millennium. It's it's a new age, a millennium, new age of dispensation, if you want to call it that. So it's a lot going on at the end of the seven years of the tribulation. Um, without getting too deep in the previous teachings, Daniel 2, we talked about the four kingdoms that would rise from the time of Daniel, Babylon, Middle Persia, Greece, and the Roman empires. And then it points to the revived Roman empire, which is a fifth kingdom. And, and this is all kind of 
coming together, this revived Roman Empire. The revived Roman Empire, when you get into Daniel 2, and, and let me just say this in passing without getting into too much detail. The revived Roman Empire, and this is tied directly to Armageddon. The revived Roman Empire is made up of the iron, the strength of government, and the force of the military, which is what the fourth, when you consider Daniel interpretation of the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw. The fourth part of that was, was Rome, or it was iron, the legs. Then you get into the feet and the toes, and it's iron, which is representative of Rome, but it's not the ancient Roman Empire in the first century, the Christianity, first, second century Christianity ended, but it's a revived Roman Empire, globalism, a global government. We see that surfacing right now, but then mix with that iron in the toes, the ten toes, and it's also tied to the ten horns of the ten union kings. But you also see mixed into that iron of the ten toes is the, the, the clay. The iron and the mora clay comes together. I taught on this previously, but the iron and the mora clay comes together. When you dig into that, the mora clay is representative of apostate believers. So this has really come to a head now at the end of the seven years of tribulation. What does all that mean? That sounds like a foreign language to me, Pastor Dagan. This is what it means. That you have these, these um, coalescing, coming together of global powers, working together under Satan. It's the Antichrist, which his interest is over the government, political, economic powers of the world. That would be considered the revived Roman global, global government, the one world government. Okay, it, it's a type of the Roman government. I realize it's not Rome, Rome, okay, but it's a type of because nobody dominated the world in, in a broad sense like the Roman Empire did. The, the Persians did not, the Medes did not, the Grecians did not, Assyria did not, Egypt did not. Rome was an entity of itself, almost unmeasurable. We have a lot of our government patterns and even uh, economic principles that we have gleaned. Yes, some from Greece, but a lot from Rome, jurisprudence and some of that. So my point is that at the end of this seven years of tribulation, at that point, the Antichrist would have risen upon this type of revived Roman government, yea, the iron seen mixed with the mara clay in the toes of the image that Daniel sees, this fifth, this fifth element of this image in Daniel 2. But coupled with that is who else? Who's the other working force during the seven years of tribulation? The false prophet. What's, what's his force that he goes forth with? Lies and false miracles. That's the apostate church. That's the apostate church. This false prophet is going forth with this apostate theology, this apostate religion. Lying signs and wonders is what Paul calls it. These things come together. And in terms of this false religion or this one world religion, you want to know what that's going to be? It's not going to be one designated group. I've heard people say, well, that has to be the Catholic Church or it has to be this. Or has No, it's not one designated group. It's everybody that buys into false doctrine and tries to blend it all together in some globalism or some form of generic Christianity or religion. Do you realize that, that different Christian ministers and imams and different authorities within the Catholic Church have gathered together to try to blend together all elements of religion? I have read books upon this, that the major tenets of Hinduism and Buddhism and Taoism and Judaism and Christianity, the major tenets that guide them, a lot of those are the same. The moral tenets, I'm not talking about this, this morbid, uh, demented form of Islam. But when you get down to pure Islam, and I'm not promoting it, but a lot of the major tenets are the same. On that backdrop, they're trying to blend together all of these religions that come up with one world religion. And, and that's contrary to the Bible, contrary to the Bible. But that Mara Clay apostate church, a form of godliness but denying the power, that is what they'll see at that time in which it kind of comes together, coalesces together between the revived Roman Empire, global dominance, Antichrist leading that, 
and working under with him is a false prophet with this generic religion that that as as one modern current religion that has a church right behind us a few blocks away, they say there's many paths but it leads to the same place. To each his own. Come on, we welcome everybody. That will be the coming together that they will see at that time. And then you see also, and I'm just kind of establishing some foundational points here as we go into a, a detailed description of the union that brings us up to Armageddon. Okay, are you with me? Can I have an amen? Many of you are watching today. Can I have an amen if you're watching with me now? This is a Friday Prophecy Live, 1 p.m. teaching. I'm doing it a night early because I'm going to be out with my family tomorrow on vacation. And I didn't want to skip this lesson. I'm going to post it tonight. But, um, but along with all of this, you also will see, of course, um, the the ten nation union or the ten horns. We've talked about that. Antichrist rises from among them, controlling three, bringing about dominance. We talked about that a lot. You also see about the seven heads upon the seven hills. Well, that is in Revelation 17, verse 379. That is a clear reference to Rome. The city of seven hills. The city of seven hills, as the Bible calls it, city of seven hills. You could Google that. That's that's Rome. It all ties together. The seven heads. Again, it's representative of the ancient controlling powers, heathen, idolatry, paganism, perversity, sexual wickedness is seen in all of these seven global ancient powers that brings us up to the end, yea, the end of the seven years of tribulation. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo Persia, Grecian Empire. The, the ancient Roman Empire, and then the revived Roman Empire, or globalism, as it would be called, one world government. We see that coming together today. And and the spirit of all of them, guess where it's captured? Guess where it's captured? Are you ready? Guess where it's captured? Guess, guess where preceded even Egypt? Guess where preceded um, Syria? Nimrod, Babel, Nimrod, Babel. Guess what Nimrod and Babel is a seed to? That is ultimately the seed to Babylon. And then what's spoken about in the book of Revelation? Mother Babylon. You know what that is? That's a spirit. It's, it's rooted back way back before the revived Roman Empire, before the ancient Roman Empire, before the Grecian Empire, before Medo-Persia, before the Babylonians, before Assyria, before Egypt. You have Nimrod, Babel, the Tower of Babel. That's where it's really rooted at. And then it comes full to, to maturity and, and full growth in Babylon. And then it continues by name, Mother Babylon. That's an apostate spirit, that anti-God spirit, that spirit of antichrist, the spirit that's trying to destroy traditional marriage and trying to destroy sexuality, the spirit that's trying to destroy all that is right and good. That is that undermining apostate spirit, that uh, spirit of antichrist, the spirit of mother Babylon, all that's working together. And it comes to a head. It comes to a climax at the end of the seven years of tribulation, working through the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan, the dragon. And now we come to the climax, the climax, the seventh bold judgment, Armageddon. Can you go with me? Daniel chapter 7, verse 22. I want to, I want to read through some Old Testament passages. Daniel, Joel, Zechariah. Then I want to get into some of Paul's writings and then extensively into the book of Revelation. One passage right after another now as we go through this. Can I have an amen? Several folks are watching here now. <clears throat> Again, we welcome you. I see some, some new people watching. I've not uh, seen your names before. My name is Pastor Daniel Dagan. I pastor United Pentecostal Church in Port Charlotte, Florida. Hope Apostolic UPC. Our website is hopeapostolicupc.org. You can go onto our website, see all kinds of information about us. I teach online every Thursday, 
7 p.m. Eastern Time, a one-hour Bible study on a number of different Bible doctrines. I welcome all questions. I don't answer questions on the feed while I'm teaching just because it breaks the fluidity of teaching and the flow of the Spirit. But you can email me, PastorDagan at gmail.com. If you want to fuss and cuss, I don't respond. I'm not your guy. But if you want to send me a legitimate email, and I will respond to that. I do it all the time. If you attend an apostolic church, ask your pastor before you email me. And I'll be glad to respond to you uh, in such a manner. And, and then from there, every Friday at 1 p.m., I teach what I call Prophecy Live. And I have a passion for end time prophecy. This is our latest book, The Unveiling, A Study Guide of End Time Prophecy. It's 310 pages long, and it's copyrighted with an ISBN number done professionally. Um, it covers uh, the basics, the overview of end time prophecy. I'm a very strong pre-tribulation rapture teacher. I think anything else is false doctrine. I, of course, don't equate that position, the importance of agreeing on that to Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38 is salvation. But I'm a very strong pre-tribulation rapture teacher. The Bible does not work if you don't take that position. And, and, I, and I invite all questions and all dialogue. It doesn't matter who they are. I'm not, I'm not boasting and I'm not fussing and cussing. But if somebody has a question, send it to me and I welcome it. Okay? That's not a boastful, arrogant statement. It's a very honest statement. But um, we teach on Fridays, 1 o'clock Eastern Time, same Facebook page, dealing with end time prophecy. I'm on vacation this week, so I'm doing it tonight, posting it, because I'll be out with my family tomorrow with the holiday weekend, but I wanted to teach this lesson. With that being said, we're going to continue teaching on Armageddon. And I'm going to ask you to go with me to the book of Daniel. As we go to the book of Daniel, chapter 7, um, I could teach extensively, background, lead up to these different passages and verses. I'm not saying that boastfully. I'm just saying it as a point of fact. But but I don't want to get into a lot of detail in each verse because I have a lot to cover. Okay? But Daniel 7, 22, we begin to paint a picture of what Armageddon will look like. Again, I've already said Armageddon, in terms of the Antichrist, from his perspective, he will gather together the kings of the earth as the demonic spirits, Revelation 16 goes out, draws the kings of the earth to the Antichrist, to this battle, to ultimately in the Antichrist's mind, it will be to destroy Israel. That won't happen. Jesus, of course, steps in. A great victor. But 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 that's what's going on in the mind of the Antichrist. With that being said, let's read. Daniel 7, 22. This is, um, when, you, when you begin to read through this, this speaks of how the Ancient of Days comes. It's very much the end pitch of the Antichrist through what Jesus does. Okay? It says in Daniel 7, 22. The Antichrist will make war with the saints and prevail against them until Daniel 7, 22. The Ancient of Days, that's Jesus Christ, comes and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. So that's a reference of Jesus Christ coming. Stay with me. We're going to build the doctrine right now. Just imagine that you're standing in air and you're, you're trying to build a doctrinal floor under you concerning Jesus coming to Armageddon. We're doing that right now. We just laid the first brick down. Stay with me. We're going to keep dropping bricks in there. Are you with me? It says in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 to 45. Say amen if you're with me. Sister Calk, it's great to have you with us from Shreveport, Louisiana. Sister Calk, I don't, I recognize the name. I don't know if it's the same family. I knew a pastor Calk. Same spelling in Louisiana. I don't know if you're related to him. We're out of the West Monroe, Louisiana church. And I knew a pastor Kalk in, in Louisiana when we was up there. You may be related, maybe not. I don't know. But Daniel chapter 11 continues to establish and kind of fill in some of the foundational bricks on how Jesus shows up and is involved in what happens at the time of Armageddon. It says, it says in... In uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 20, I'm sorry, verse 40 down to 45. 
Daniel 11, verse 40 down to 45. And, and kind of hear the language and start pulling out some things we've already talked about where the valley of Armageddon is, where the battle is going to be at, the valley of Estralon. We've talked about how that's about 20 miles south of Haifa, about 50 miles north of Jerusalem. But, but that area and that time is also described in other wording. And we're going to look at that almond seer, Edom, uh, Moab, uh, Basra, the Valley of Josephat. All of that's related to that same setting, okay? Just kind of stay with me as we build it. Verse 40, Daniel 11. Daniel, of course, is a prophet to Israel. Sees uh, 483 years up into the time in which Israel rebuilds Jerusalem and the temple and the, and the city, the walls until the cutting off of the Messiah, and then he sees the seven years of tribulation. He doesn't see the church age. Daniel, the prophet of Israel, gives us this concerning um, the Armageddon and what happens at that time. Verse 40. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. The king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and I shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter in unto the glorious land, and many countries shall be on overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand. Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Omen. Omen. And Edom is also known as Seir. You've got to dig in a little bit in the Bible to see that. Second Chronicles 20 will show you some of that. Verse 42, Daniel 11. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries in the land of Egypt to the south of Israel shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over the precious things of Egypt and Libya and the Ethiopian shall be at his step. Verse 44. But the tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. And yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. So that's speaking of what's going to happen to the Antichrist as all of this begins to unfold. As all of this begins to unfold. Go with me now to the book of Joel. This great, great prophetic book that looks to the time of the Gentiles. And the end of the times of the Gentiles. All of that intersects, intersects there at the period of Armageddon. At the period of Armageddon. So we understand that the church is raptured before the seven years. But notice here after you get through the great prophecies in Joel 2 that Peter quotes that begins the times of the Gentiles, Acts 2, Acts 2. Now we come to the end of the seven years of tribulation. Church has been raptured prior to God's wrath, prior to the seven seals that God sends down from heaven, prior to church is raptured prior to God's wrath. Prior to the seven angels coming out of heaven, coming out of heaven, blowing the trumpet judgments prior to the church's rapture, the seven vile judgment, judgments being poured out from heaven. We see now in Joel chapter three, kind of painting the picture, painting the picture of what happens around the end of the seven years of tribulation Armageddon. It says in Joel chapter three, verse one and two. For behold, in those days and in that time when I shall bring again <clears throat> excuse me, the captivity of Judah, of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Josephat. That's very key. The valley of Josephat is tied together when you really begin to get into um, the land of Moab, Omen, Seir or, or Edom, all of these things are tied together. The valley of Josephat 
that language terminology, Omen, Moab, Seir, Edom, Basra, all of that's tied together, okay? When you really get into that scripturally, stay with me. Joel chapter 3, verse 2, okay? All the nations come together. That's what you see in Revelation 16. It's going to all begin to come together now. We're building this foundational understanding about Armageddon. It says in Joel 3, 2, and all nations. Can you type in all? Can you type in all? Let me know you're with me. All nations will bring them down into the valley of Josephat. Okay? That, that, that is a reference back to all kings. Revelation 16, verse uh, 17, uh, verse 12 down to verse 17. You read about those demonic spirits coming out of the mouth of Satan. Coming out of the mouth of the Antichrist. Coming out of the mouth of the false prophet. They go forth. Revelation 16, 12 to 17. These demonic spirits go forth to all kings of the earth and draw them to Armageddon. This is tied together. Anchoring point ties the passages together. Are you with me? Goes, it continues. Joel chapter 3, uh, verse 2. And I will gather all nations, will bring them down into the valley of Josephat. And will plead with them there for my people, for my heritage, Israel, who may have scattered among the nations and parted my land. So there, Israel has been scattered. But up into the time of the millennium, Israel will regather. The Hebrews will regather. And there's been a mass repopulation of Israel since the United Nations 1948 announced them as a nation. Since that time, since the Six Day War, since even what happened just a couple years ago, Jerusalem being recognized by the moving of the U.S. Embassy as the eternal capital, as Benjamin Netanyahu said of Israel, all of that has caused a massive repopulation and re-migration of Hebrews back to Israel. That will continue. Judah, Jerusalem, Israel, all of them are coming together. All the Jews are coming together and it's, it will continue to build up until the time Jesus comes on the white horse and the millennium temple will be built in Jerusalem. They will continue to regather at that place. We pick it up in verse 6 of Joel chapter 3. Boy, I feel the Holy Ghost tonight. Joel chapter 3. Can I have an amen? It says in Joel 3 verse 6, The children also of Judah, the children of Jerusalem, have ye sold unto the Grecians, that ye might remove them far from their border. But God's going to reverse all that. He has. He's continuing to reverse it. They're coming home. They're coming home. Verse 9. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords. Your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say I am strong. Assemble yourselves. Come all ye heathen. Gather yourselves together. Round about thither. Cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened. Come up to the valley of Josephat. That's that same point of reference. For there will, there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. All the heathens round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the grass is full. The fats overflow. For their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Stop the tape. This reference, it's speaking about the judgment that Jesus is coming with when he comes to Armageddon. We'll get to those passages in a moment. But when he comes to Armageddon, he's coming with judgment. He's coming with judgment. 
He's coming not to just pronounce the final and eternal judgment upon the Antichrist and the false prophet, but he's also coming to pronounce judgment on the nations that will not serve him, that will not serve him. So this is going to be multiple things happening when Jesus comes. He's coming as he comes. He's coming to also establish a place of worship in Jerusalem, the Millennium Temple. And this statement in verse 14, it's often used in a secondary interpretive sense as a prophetic call that we need to get ready to meet God. We need to make a call in an election. Sure, today is the decisions have come to our house. We need to choose God today. I agree with that. But that's not really the primary focal point of Joel 3.14. Joel 3.14, when it says multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, dig into that statement. When you dig into that statement, valley of decision, it said twice in verse 14 of Joel 3. It is a reference to an indetermined place, uncertain measurement. It goes back to the reference of the valley of Josephat earlier in the chapter in verse 2 and then and then um, coming up in verse 12, we've seen it as well. So all that points to valley of decision, valley of decision, valley of Josephat. All that points to Armageddon, that parcel of land Armageddon. That's what it's pointing to. Prophetically, symbolically, it's pointing to that. It will be a place when those nations and those kings pledge their allegiance to the Antichrist, they will be judged. When he judges, when Jesus, we're getting there, I, I don't want to go there just yet, but when we get to Revelation 19, you'll see it. When he judges, Jesus on the white horse judges the Antichrist and the false prophet, the next judgment that he gives is to the remnant of people that follow the Antichrist. That's those kings. That's an anchoring point. Ties these passages together. Do you see it? It's an anchoring point. It's an anchoring point. How many know when you follow God through the leadership of a man of God, the favor of God's blessing comes down like the anointing that comes down the garments of Aaron to the congregation that follows God, yea, in following the under-shepherd, the man of God. The same thing. When you follow the blind, you are such blind and you fall in the ditch. The kings that pledge their allegiance to the Antichrist will be judged in the same regard as the people that worship the image of the Antichrist that take the mark of the beast in their hand and in their forehead. It's the same judgment. You need to be careful. We all need to be careful. I need to be careful who we are following and who we are pledging our allegiance to. First, we follow Jesus, but God gives us under shepherds. You better make sure the under shepherd you're walking with is walking with God. I want to make sure a man of God that I am following is following God. The nation of Israel followed Moses because Moses followed God. His cloud by day and his fiery cloud by night. I wish I could get an amen right there. Hallelujah. So it goes on in Joel and Joel chapter 3. Let me keep reading down to the end of verse 17. The sun and the moon shall be darkened. The stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord shall roar out of Zion. That's speaking. When we get to Revelation, you'll see. Jesus is coming. Guess, guess where his judgment's coming from? It's a sword that comes out of his mouth. It's a sword that comes out of his mouth. Do you see that? In verse uh, 16, the Lord shall roar out of Zion. Zion is a reference to Jerusalem. So Armageddon will be about 50 miles geographically. It is about 50 miles north of Jerusalem. He's coming and a sword's coming out of his mouth. And judgment is going to be released out of his mouth and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth. He'll put his feet on Mount Olivet at this point. Yeah, that's right there uh, near Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of, the, of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Once you begin to notice the language, the, the focus point turns now to Israel. That's one of the main points 
of the seven years of tribulation, as I've taught previously. I've got about 20 more minutes of teaching. Um, I hope you're with me. <clears throat> but one of the main focal points of the seven years of tribulation is <clears throat> certainly for God to pour out his wrath upon unrepentant, sinful people. <clears throat> also, the seven years of tribulation is about fulfilling the last of the prophecies concerning and then also about ultimately bringing Israel to the place of recognizing Jesus as Messiah and bringing them to a place of repentance and true humility and then from there transitioning into the millennium kingdom. That's the main focal point of the seven years of tribulation. Okay, during all of that, the focus turns from the Gentiles to Israel. Gentiles to Israel. He goes back to his first love. He goes back to the first olive branch. And you see that verse 17. <clears throat> so shall you know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion. Hear the language. This is the end of Joel's prophecies concerning the season around Armageddon. He's at the end of his prophecies. He's at the end of the season of Armageddon, the end of the seven years pointing towards the thousand year millennial kingdom. Hear the language. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God. Hear me, dwelling. He didn't just come, but now the language has changed. That he's come to Zion. Now it says he's dwelling, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem, then shall Jerusalem behold. What's that about? Remember when the temple is defiled, when Jerusalem is defiled, when is that? Well, this is prophesying about the end of the seven years. What happened 42 months earlier? The abomination desolation. Abomination, that's defilement. Abomination, that's when the Antichrist sets himself up in the Jewish temple. That defiles all of it, defiles all of it. Well, Jesus comes and makes a reckoning of all of that. A day of reckoning takes place at Armageddon. And when that's over, he says, I will dwell in Zion, the holy mountain, that's Jerusalem. And then shall Jerusalem be holy. And there shall no strangers pass through her anymore. Do you see that? So this is not just a prophecy that we can take and throw in 70 AD. Or we can say, well, preacher, that's your interpretation. This prophecy could be applied to anything. We don't have a clue. No, wrong, wrong, wrong. The text interpretates the text. Okay, he says he will dwell in Jerusalem. Okay, he says Jerusalem will be holy. He says that no more strangers will dwell there or pass through there. Do you know when that takes place? There's only one place in the biblical timeline that you can say there will be no strangers, no heathens, no Muslims, no pagans in Jerusalem, in the land of God, in Israel. You want to know when that is? The millennium. The millennium. The millennium. Because everybody that's alive during the millennium will worship Jesus Christ as Messiah. Uh, the, the, the church will be with them in celestial bodies because we're raptured before the church. Before the seven years of tribulation, the church is raptured. From that point forward, we will be in celestial heavenly bodies. But from the time of the rapture forward, wherever Jesus goes, we go. So we will be with them during the millennial kingdom in celestial heavenly bodies, spiritual bodies, much like the angels, different, different, but much like the angels, we would have celestial redeemed bodies, no flesh and blood. All the Old Testament saints, many of them, that's raptured on the third day, resurrection day, Matthew 27, 50 to 52, will be with him as well in celestial bodies. But then there will be several uh, tribulation saints that will be martyred. Um, and then there'll be several tribulation saints that will live through Armageddon in a physical fleshly sense. And they will live into the millennial kingdom in a physical body. So it'll be a unique time. They will be in a physical body, but we will be there. The church, the church, many Old Testament saints that's raptured or resurrected, Matthew 27, 50 to 52, your Bible talks about. After Jesus of first fruit is resurrected, they will all, we will all be with Jesus in the millennial temple, in the millennial kingdom, in Jerusalem, in the earth, in a celestial body, in a spiritual heavenly sense, if you will. Angels, of course, be there as well. 
And, and during that time, there's no strangers. There's no heathens. You don't have to worry about the Dome of the Rock. You don't have to worry about Allah and, and Hera Krishna and Muhammad and all these different strangers and pagans and auto worship. You don't have to worry about any of that. Okay. Everybody that's there during the millennial kingdom, all of them will worship Jesus Christ. Okay. All of them will worship Jesus Christ. And, and from that point, there's nothing else that takes place upon the earth. When the millennium kingdom is over, um, we'll get into this in, in future lessons. Uh, Satan will be released for one final season to make efforts to deceive those that were born during the millennial kingdom. There will be some people born in a physical sense, but they would have never been tested by Satan or tempted because he'll be bound for a thousand years during the millennial kingdom. And it seems very much like the sinful nature of man is all but um, just kept under wraps during that time. But then after the thousand year millennial kingdom, your Bible says that Satan will be released for one final season. I believe that is to tempt those that was born during the millennial kingdom. And then Satan will be cast into the lake of fire. Okay, let's go forward into Zechariah 14. I'm running, I'm running out of time here. Let's go forward into Zechariah 14, 1 through 5. Another passage that deals with, that deals with the battle of Armageddon. And let me just hit this quickly here. Um, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. Thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. Remember in the opening of the lesson, we talked about the sixth year, the seventh vial, and how Jerusalem is going to be divided. This is all tied together. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem. Remember, we've talked about it previously in Joel. Now we talked about it in Revelation 16. Now we see it in Zechariah 14. All nations of the earth will be gathered together against Israel. All nations pledging their allegiance against, against Israel with the leadership of the Antichrist. All nations against Jerusalem. You see it? The battle and the city shall be taken and houses uh, destroyed. Women ravished and half the city shall go forth into captivity. The residue of the people shall not, uh, shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth. So right in the midst of that, God's coming. Boom. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against these nations as when he fought, as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand. Hold on to this. It's coming back up. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east in the Mount of Olives shall cleave and shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east, towards the west. And there should be a great valley, valley, valley. There it is. The valley of Josephat, the valley of Estralon. There, that place, that place, that place, Armageddon, that's all tied together. And half of the mountain shall be moved towards the north, half towards the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. That fleeing is also captured in Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse. Fleeing to Judah, fleeing to Judah. And, and the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. So you got to just hold on to several things here. Make a note. I'm about to run out of time. You're going to join me next Friday at 1 p.m. and watch it. Take the late sometime later if you're working. But hold on to when the Lord comes, who's coming with them? The saints. The saints are coming with him. The saints are coming with them. Did you also catch in verse 4 that the Lord is going to come? And where is, he putting, where is he going to put his feet at? Can you type in the Mount of Olives? The Mount of Olives? Okay? The Mount of Olives. He said, the Bible says, and his feet. Do you see that? His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. I have a question. Those people that believe that the church will be raptured after the seven years of tribulation. I have a question. The rapture takes place and we're caught up to meet them in the air. The dead in Christ rise first. First Thessalonians 4, 15 to 17. The dead in Christ rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet them in the air. At the rapture, the Lord does not come to the earth. We meet him in the air. But 
at the second coming or the glorious appearing. I'll get into this deeper next week. At the second coming or the glorious appearing when he returns for Armageddon. That's identified as a second coming. It's identified as a glorious appearing. That's different than the rapture. Two different events. Rapture before the seven years. We go to him, meet him in the air. Second coming, glorious appearing. At the end of the seven years, Armageddon, he comes to the earth. Puts his feet on the earth. Does that sound familiar? Jesus standing on the Mount of Olives, does that sound familiar? Yes, it does. Remember when Jesus was delivering the Great Commission? Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, Acts 1. He takes them out as far as the Mount of Olives, Acts 1, 10 to 12. He takes them out as far as the Mount of Olives, and they're standing there gazing at the Mount of Olives, your Bible says, and there's an angel speaking to him in the same place where he goes up, he comes back down. The angel says the same place where you see him leave, he's coming back to. When's that fulfilled? Here, at the end of the seven years, when he comes, glorious appearing. Second coming, Titus 2.13. He comes to Armageddon. Well, one of the things that takes place is, in the midst of that, his return, is he puts his feet on the Mount of Olives. I wish I could get a good amen from somebody. Second Thessalonians, let me just get you into the New Testament. I can feel your appetite. You're fading on me. I'm fading. My voice is fading. It's late in the night. I'm on vacation. Hallelujah. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. Give me an amen if you got another minute. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. You got another minute. Can I get an amen? So 2 Thessalonians 2, I taught several weeks ago, Friday, 1 p.m. I've been teaching Friday, 1 p.m. on end time prophecy since the middle of March. This, because I'm going to be on vacation tomorrow, I'm doing it tonight. Previous to this, I've done every single one of them Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern time, same Facebook page. When you go back, I've taught several times on 2 Thessalonians 2. There's a lot of teaching here, hours of teaching in this one chapter. I want you to just see and just hear. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8 is, is speaking of what the Lord of heaven, Jesus, is going to do when he comes for Armageddon. Okay? Armageddon is really the battle that never takes place. In terms of Jesus and the saints on the white horses engaging in some type of combat with the Antichrist and his army, it's a battle that never takes place. It says in verse 8, Jesus just speaks the word, it's over. It says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, Then shall that wicked be revealed. That's a reference to the Antichrist, the son of perdition. Whom the Lord, does that sound familiar? Yes, it does. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. With the brightness of his coming. That's that's interesting. That's, that's interesting to me. That, that's interesting to me. So um, it says that, that wicked, the Antichrist, whom the Lord Jesus shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Verse 9 is another reference to the Antichrist. Can you go with me now to Revelation 16 quickly? Revelation 16, verse 14 down to 16. So Jesus is going to come. We've seen it in Old Testament prophecies from Daniel as the agent of days was coming. We've seen it in Daniel as the stone coming down that was cut out without hands that destroys the ten toes, that destroys the ten toes destroys the ten toes. And then we've seen it as well here in, in, in Joel. And then we've seen it in Zechariah 14. Now we see it in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8, where it says the Lord is going to come and he's going to consume the Antichrist, the son of perdition, the wicked one with the spirit of his mouth. Notice what it says in Revelation 16, verse 14, down to verse 16. 
I'll just paraphrase it. This is what we've already read earlier tonight about the gathering at Armageddon. Now, look at Revelation chapter 17. I'm running out of time. Revelation chapter 17, verse 12 down to verse 14. Revelation 17, verse 12 to 14. All of this on the backdrop of Armageddon and Jesus coming to destroy the Antichrist. Are you with me? Revelation 17, 12. And the ten horns, and that's an anchor point. You see that reference ten throughout the book of Daniel. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. Okay, so it's not just symbols mean whatever you want it to mean. The Bible interpretates the Bible. There's an the interpretation. The ten horns that thou sawest are ten kings or kingdoms controlling dominions. Probably some type of union like the European Union, the EU, which have received no kingdom as yet, but we see power as kings one hour with the beast. The beast is the Antichrist. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength to the beast. So they work in union, union, union. They have one mind, one mind, like at the Tower of Babel. One mind they shall do what they imagine to do. They work in agreement under with the strength, the leadership of the beast, the Antichrist. Then, verse 14, then shall then these shall make war with the lamb that's the mistake with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is the lord of lords king of kings and they that are with him are called the chosen and the faithful the chosen and the faithful so there's a reference to armageddon they make war these 10 dominant global kings and others Make war with the Antichrist against Jesus Christ the Lamb. It's interesting to me as we go to the last passage tonight. I'll stop. Uh, Revelations 19, 11 down. Uh, this is the last passage and I'll stop. Okay. This is the end of Armageddon in terms of the battle. I'll give you some more information next week. But this is the end of Armageddon in terms of the battle. This is it. Okay. It's interesting to me that, that the picture is painted in Revelation 17, Lamb, I have a question. Why is that? Why in that reference is he seeing the great victor that destroys the Antichrist in his reign and his, and his armies? Why is he painted in the eternal text of the Bible as the Lamb? Because it says, Revelations 13 and 8, we overcome by the word of our testimony in what? In what? We overcome by the word of a testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. It's interesting to me how many times Jesus, we understand there's one God, one God. Many different descriptive titles that paints a picture of his vastness in the Bible, yea, in the book of Revelation. But that one God is seen commonly, repeatedly as the Lamb in the book of Revelation and as the Lion. And as the Lion. The Lamb, so we never forget the power of Calvary. So we never forget the power of the blood. So we never stop celebrating, memorializing, commemorating, giving thanks for Calvary, death, burial, resurrection. Even into eternity, the Lamb is celebrated when it's time no more. And then the Lion expresses his great vigor, absolute dominance. Okay, this is it. The end of the battle of Armageddon. The battle that never really happens. Foolish, stupid Satan, Antichrist, and the false prophet. Who do they think they were to be a match for Jesus? The omnipotent God. Revelations 19, 11. I'm done. I'm done. My last passage. Revelations 19, 11. Okay, it says, and, and previous in the chapter, it speaks of the marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb. It speaks of the celebration that the bride and the bridegroom Jesus is going to have. I see that taking place, taking place beginning at least prior to the seven years of tribulation because the church is already raptured. Now, later we get into verse 11. I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true righteous. He doeth judge and make war. His eyes were as flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written 
that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. Who are those armies? Those are the saints. We've already read about them. Those are the saints. Who are they? That is the Old Testament, many Old Testament saints that were raptured. Matthew 27, 50 to 52. After Jesus, the first fruits came out of the tomb. And then that is the raptured, resurrected church prior to the seven years of tribulation. Okay, that's who that is. And then also, of course, angels are with them. Out of his mouth. Remember his mouth. That's what's used to destroy. Out of his mouth. Out of his mouth. Out of his mouth. Can I have an amen? Out of his mouth. Out of his mouth, your Bible says. Out of his, out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword. That with it he should smite the nations. What nations is that? That's all those nations we read about that are following the Antichrist. Smite the nations, and he shall rule them with the rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepresses of the fierceness of his wrath, the wrath of Almighty God. Okay, that that is, again, emphasizing all the wrath of the seven years. 21 judgments is the wrath of God. Okay, it's not the wrath of Satan. It's foolishness. Post-tribulations teach that they're ignorant. They don't know what they're talking about. On that point, verse 16, and he had on me on his vesture on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God that ye may eat the flesh of the kings. That's the kings that follow the Antichrist, the flesh of the captains. The flesh of the mighty men, the flesh of the horses, then to sit upon them, the flesh of men, both free and bond, both small and great. That's all those people that pledge allegiance to the Antichrist. Here's the end of the Antichrist and the false prophet. Yea, this is the end of Armageddon, the battle that really never takes place. There's some persecution and attacks against the people of Israel that the Antichrist levies. But in terms of him fighting against God, it never really happens. Him fighting against Jesus on the white horse, it never happens. Verse 19, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat upon the horse and against his army. So there it is, the Antichrist and all of the kings of the earth, all the kings, have gathered to make war against Israel, but now they've turned their focus against Jesus, him that's upon the horse, and his army of saints has come with him. I see these horses not as physical flesh and blood horses, but much like the horses that's mentioned, days of Elijah, chariots of fire. That's what I see. Okay, and then verse 20, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, and that was wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image. These were both cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So the false prophet's done. The Antichrist is done. They're in the lake of fire. They're the first two inhabitants, eternal inhabitants of Guiana, the lake of fire, the second death, the eternal death. Verse 21 and the remnant, that's the followers of the Antichrist. You got to be careful. Every time you read the word remnant, it's not talking about the followers of God. Every time you read the word saint, it's not talking about the Old Testament saints of Israel. It's not talking about the church. You got to look at the passage for what those words mean. On and on. Words of elect mean the same thing. So, verse 21. The remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse with the word which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. That is the end of Armageddon. The armies are annihilated. So I want to stop right there. We'll pick up there, pick up there next time, next Friday, 1 p.m. Again, I talk Prophecy Live, Armageddon, part one tonight. I'll post it right now um, because I'm going to be on vacation tomorrow. So God bless you. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, any questions, email me. If you want to fuss and cuss, I'm not your guy. But if you want to reach out, honest dialogue, I welcome questions. If you attend an apostolic church, talk to your pastor before you reach out to me because I will if any questions come up. Let me pray for us. 
Lord God, thank you for your grace and your mercy, your love and your kindness. Go with us, Lord God. Help us, God, to make a calling, an election sure. Help us, God, to compel others to come to not just your house, but come into fellowship with you and your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name, Lord God, we humbly pray. Amen, amen, amen. Be safe. Reach your soul. Anybody you know in this community of Southwest Florida, direct them to us. Hope at God bless you. Talk to you soon.